Mark, I'm not sure if you're muted. Uh, oh, let me mute myself. I have to wait. Okay, hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the Yali 10 Virtual Summit Special Session on the Art of Servant Leadership, looking at high performance teams. My name is Liz, I am the Special Coordinator for the Young African Leaders Initiative at the US Department of State, and I'm really, really excited to be here with you today for this session. The theme of the day is servant leadership, which you may have heard me say before, I really feel is the soul of YALI. It's what makes our young African leaders so special is living and breathing that philosophy of servant leadership, which the goal is to serve others. Um, servant leadership involves vision, passion, empathy, and an unwavering belief that each and every individual has the capacity to achieve. Nelson Mandela once said, it is better to lead from behind and to put others in front, especially when you celebrate victory, when nice things occur. You take the front line when there is danger, then people will appreciate your leadership. This is the type of leadership that brings communities together instead of tearing them apart. It's the type of leadership that listens to others rather than speaking at them. The type of leadership that consistently makes the decision to sacrifice time and energy for the greater good of one's community. And this is the type of leadership that YALI exemplify each and every day. I'm very pleased to introduce to you our featured lecturer this morning, Harvey Floyd II. Harvey is an organizational psychologist senior executive coach and university lecturer at the Wharton School, who specializes in areas of diversity and inclusion, leading and managing complex change, executive development, and high performance teams. Harvey has forged, facilitated, and consulted on strategic initiatives and organizations, such as the Center for Creative Leadership, Booz Allen Hamilton, and the Federal Aviation Administration by leveraging systems change principles that connect people, processes, and strategies. So more importantly than anything you'll see on his bio is that Harvey lives and breathes servant leadership himself. He is a friend, he is a mentor. I know from having worked with him that you are going to just get a lot out of today's program. So thank you so much um, for joining us today. And Harvey, you want to say a few words, and then I have a few questions for you. Absolutely. Uh, happy Wednesday. I am humbled and honored uh, to be here, uh, to be alongside you, Liz, uh, in service of what we all know to be true. This is one of the most dynamic and compelling missions, visions, and aims. And so as I think about sort of the future and the potential for not just Yali to fulfill its potential, but you know, what that looks like in light of you know, our investment in entrepreneurs across the continent, I think we've only scratched the surface of what's possible. And you know, listen, I sit in many, many wonderful and unique intersections and I feel privileged uh, to join leaders in their journey at multiple points this for me is special because at the core of who I am uh, is this fundamental belief that servant leadership um, is a more effective and impactful way um, to influence change, to bring people along with us on that path um, and to do it together. I do think we're better together. So Liz, uh, you know, friends in the audience, I'm really happy to be with you. And to, to sort of uncover a couple of principles around high-performing teams. Uh, what's the link between servant leadership 
and and getting the best out of teams, truly helping them become greater than the sum of their parts. So, um, Liz, I know you have a couple of questions for me before I, I dive in. Uh, the floor is yours. Fire away. Okay, Harvey. Yes, thank you. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, so I, I do have a couple questions. My first is, can you tell us a little bit more about why servant leadership is important to you and how it's contributed to your success? What a wonderful question. Listen, you know, I say this often. I, I try to be clear about it everywhere that I go. I do have this fundamental belief that my feet are on the planet to be of service to leaders. It has uh, been forged over time. Uh, you know, I suspect that watching my parents live servant leadership in front of me day to day in the way that they mentored and, and, and you know, uh, extended themselves oftentimes to help others grow and to fulfill their potential. That clearly uh, was a seed that was planted in my own sort of life and my mind and my thinking. And, and then, you know, as I sort of, you know, journeyed from <laughs> multiple places sort of education and, you know, sort of nonprofit and, and for-profit and now, you know, higher ed and executive education, it, it has just been this thing that has become core to who I am. Um, I, I think about it daily. As a matter of fact, um, I've got a flip chart here that uh, that I sort of do business with daily. And the question here, uh, the bottom left in green marker says, you know, what is the highest and best use of my skills, abilities, purpose and or calling? And so that's a question that I think about every single day. And I like to hold myself accountable to that. What is the highest and best use? So servant leadership is personal to me. Whether I am coaching a, you know, an executive team, whether I am teaching at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania in front of executives or traditional grad students, whether I'm teaching at State Department, at FSI, or doing work in the private sector with a client, it is that fundamental belief that my feet are here on the planet to be of service. And I have some unique tools in ways that I get to do that. So teaching is one. Being an ex executive coach is another. Being a high performance sort of team coach is another. Uh, but mentoring is another tool that I use to really serve and to help other people identify or think about and embrace who they are at their best. What is it that they're aiming to do and or accomplish? And how can I sort of come alongside them in their journey at just the right time to help them find the confidence, the skills, the abilities, the strength, the fortitude, anything that is required of them to take that next step? And so that drives me. Now, I think at the end of the day, it's been such an anchor for me that, you know, um, it has kept me buoyed in difficult moments. Uh, it has helped me make some very critical decisions. Uh, it has helped me say no and say yes. It also refreshes me. It energizes me because as far as I can see and tell, I am doing what I feel I've been carved out to do. Harvey, I heard so many things there. First of all, I, your parents, uh, I know they were a wonderful inspiration. Harvey's dad was special forces, uh, military. And so I, I understand very deeply that that concept of service is just ingrained with who you are. Um, and what I'm hearing also is that you wake up every day, you see that green writing on your flip chart and you think about what your purpose is and serving with purpose I think is is really important these days. It's very easy to just wake up, look at your phone, get tied up in social media, responding to things and kind of forget about like, wait, what is my purpose? What is my goal? Um, who am I out here to serve today? So thank you for that. That was really powerful. Um, you specialize specifically, not just in servant leadership, but in developing and maintaining high performance teams. So can you tell us how you got into high performance teams as a focal point and how that shows up in your work? Yeah, absolutely. Listen, you know, that that too is a bit of a personal sort of journey and experience. I think anyone in this call who's listening, who has led for any extended period of time would probably attest to the fact that uh, at some point you hit your wall. There's only so much that you can do um, on your own. And you know, listen, I'm I'm a fan of, of sort of the science of leadership and leader development and 
You know, I've studied it from an individual perspective, also at a, you know, a, ch a chain sort of leadership perspective. And, you know, at the intersection of my own personal experience and what I know to be true, but then also when we look at sort of where the world uh, you know, is, maybe where it's headed, when we start to talk about sort of the complexity that we're wrestling with and change being the norm, I think no matter any sort of leader's uh, mission or aim, or change that they want to create, the best way to operationalize that is through a team. Now, on the leadership side, you know, I love personality psychologists like Robert Hogan, who essentially says, listen, you know, the fundamental purpose of your leadership is to sort of maybe exact your influence on a group of people to get them to accomplish things, but you should be in service of them and their ability to continue to lead well and better. So leadership isn't really this sort of like individual pursuit, although depending on where you're from, the cultural context might cause you to believe that it is, right? I really do believe that a leader's fundamental purpose is to build and lead high-performing teams to get the work accomplished. That does take a great act of selflessness. It can be an arduous path sometimes. I think one of the sort of great mistakes we have made, even in the world of leadership development, we always prioritize the individual over the team. But again, you hit a point in your own journey where you recognize I need a team to get the work accomplished. And so I hit that intersection myself, having hit burnout and, and just sort of recognizing that, you know what, um, it's great to be, um, you know, an A player. It's even better to be a part of an all-star team. And there's something that happens when you are on a team that does perform well, and you realize that maybe you can be greater than the sum of your parts, and maybe you are able to create an environment that brings out the best in each person so that our sort of collective effort and collective intelligence are now wielded against these really pressing issues and challenges that we're facing in the world and in our world. So whether you're an entrepreneur, right, sort of thinking about how do I innovate? How do I solve this sort of, you know, this this challenge or I've identified a gap in the marketplace and I believe my innovation sits right there. Running alone can only carry you so far. It will be your ability to create a compelling sort of purpose around that thing that you want to do and bringing people along with you, leading them well, that allows you all to deliver on that mission and vision. And perhaps when you've got the right team, there is something really unique. I'm not gonna call it magic, but something really unique that can happen, right? Where everyone is able to really sort of shape the process, shape the experience. And it does become bolder, better, right? More enriched than if it were just the solo dynamic and amazing person really pushing down that path. Harvey, I love that. You made me think about uh, The Last Dance, the documentary about the Chicago Bulls <laughs> and how amazing their team was. You know, even Michael Jordan could not do it on his own, right? As fabulous and amazing as he was, he needed Scotty, he needed Phil, he needed, you know, everybody on that team. So um, absolutely. absolutely. Beautiful beautiful for you to highlight that, you know, as someone who has grown up probably idolizing the man. And, you know, here's a, here's a fun fact. Uh, I was a basketball player. I was not a great one, but my parents invested in basketball camps to help me become a better one. Michael Jordan would attend that camp every year. It was led by my father, my father's friend named Fred, Whit, uh, Fred Whitfield, who is actually the COO of the Charlotte Hornets basketball team. He and Michael Jordan have been uh, in relationship for a couple of decades now. So Fred would run the basketball camp. I would attend every year. Um, I met Michael Jordan one time. Wow. And talk about sort of leaders, right? I, <laughs> I, I prepared my, you know, if I meet Michael speech, that speech never made it out of my mouth. <laughs> I was so overwhelmed and enamored by this man that I had admired both for his ability to be exceptional, but also the way his, he led his team to, you know, stellar performance after performance year after year, 
you know, the coaching. I just loved so much about what I saw. I met him. I walked up to him. I grabbed his arm. And the only thing that I could get out of my mouth was one word. Michael. <laughs> that was it. But so, you know, what a beautiful image, though, to highlight, you know, yes, he and, you know, in and of himself, perhaps the greatest of all time. But that team, I don't know that there will never, you know, that there will ever be another team, right, that was able to accomplish what the Chicago Bulls were able to accomplish over time. Great coaching, great collaboration, stars, but a better team that was greater than the sum of its parts. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I think... People probably focus more on the individual at first, not just maybe because of a cultural norm, because it's easier. I can very, I can so much easier control myself, what I do when I wake up, everything else. You start bringing a team into it. There's a lot of factors that you have absolutely no control over, um, and it gets really challenging. Anytime you deal with people, it's challenging, right? So That's the real work. <laughs> yes, it's the real work. So I want to pivot and get to really the subject of the day and what we really want to learn from you about and is what does it take to create and lead a high performance team? Absolutely. Well, thank you for setting the context, right? Because in the same way that you and I have engaged in this conversation to really create the conditions for receptivity, it's really the big idea around creating and leading high performing teams. And, and so, you know, I have the good fortune and privilege of working alongside someone that I have admired for a very, very long time. She and her colleague, Richard Hackman, were Harvard researchers who did uh, some pretty compelling research around what does it look like? What does it take for teams to become great? She would go on, her name is Ruth Wagaman, to write the book, Senior Leadership Teams. Today, I am partnered with Ruth and, and another dear friend, Krista Lowe, and a couple of other colleagues. And what we're really working to do is take that Harvard science that's been steeped at the intersection of practice. The research was done on you know more than 1,200 teams. The senior leadership research was done on more than 127 global teams. We are bringing that to life in ways that help team leaders better understand how to lead. We're helping people understand what team performance really is. And more importantly, right, we're helping them look at what would need to happen in order for me to create those conditions, those six conditions that the research would say really account for about 70% or 74% of the variance in team performance. Now, I'm going to talk about those conditions in just a moment, but I want you to sort of get that in your mind, that there are six conditions that contribute to up to 74% of the variance in team performance. Before we go there, I'm going to launch a poll. Just a pop quiz, team leadership pop quiz. Uh, and I am going to ask you if you're able uh, to just respond and then I'll show you the results in just a moment. I'll show you the results in just a moment. So two basic questions here around team leadership. The first is what percentage of leadership teams are outstanding in terms of team effectiveness? What percentage of leadership teams are outstanding in terms of team effectiveness. And the second question is, what percentage of leadership teams are outstanding in terms of individual and collective learning? So the poll is open. Take a moment, provide your thoughts, and let's see what shows up. Give me 30 seconds. percentage now unfortunately I can't tell the extent to which we might be uh, we might have received all the results, but I'm going to just give it 30 more seconds and then we'll close the poll and see how we're doing. Okay. 
Close the poll for the second one here in just a number, uh, just a, just a couple of seconds. So it looks like we've got a 50-50 split with respect to, uh, you know, sort of the lower percentages. And this is fascinating. Uh, it's too bad I can't have, you know, everyone come off mute and have a, a really powerful conversation around this. But this tells me that we might have a, you know, have a sort of fundamental understanding about uh, how we're actually doing, not how we think we're doing, but how we're actually doing and how we're actually showing up with respect to team effectiveness. All right, I'll close the second poll. Let's see the results here. Okay, 60% of us believe that uh, only 24% of leadership teams are outstanding. Uh, that's a, that's a, a fascinating uh, sort of number here. Well, let me let me reveal the correct answer. So based on, you know, on the research that Ruth and, and, and her colleagues did, uh, and what we know to be true about this precisely, right, is that uh, only 21% of leadership teams are outstanding at team effectiveness. Only 21%, right? So it's sort of like you ask the question, well, what does that actually mean, right? Uh, well, you know, it, it, when we talk about team effectiveness, we talk about sort of the, the quality of, of group process, so the, the ways of working, right? We also talk about the team's ability to, to deliver on the task and, and you know, it's sense that it is maybe delivering above and beyond what it, you know what the team is supposed to do, but then also we, we talk about member satisfaction, right? To what extent do people feel satisfied in, in, in being a part of the team? Are they learning? Are they growing? Do they feel they're able to truly contribute? And so when you look at team effectiveness through that lens, only twenty one percent of teams do outstanding there. Second question. Well, with respect to individual and collective learning, how many teams are outstanding? What percentage? The correct answer is 24%. What I find really fascinating about this is John Katzenbach in his work, he sort of talks about or describes teams as the central unit of performance, the central unit of performance. So if this is a structure that we all adhere to, that we all abide by, that we all participate in, think about it, maybe from the time that you were young, you were introduced to teams on the sports field. Maybe as a student, you worked in a team to get an assignment accomplished. And then when you hit the wonderful world of work, you were immediately ejected from university into the workplace context, into a team. And you just had a steady habit. And at some point, people reward you for your leadership and they go, you know what? We're going to give you a team. Now, chances are you've never been coached or received any sort of formal education and training on how to lead a team, but yet you have inherited that wonderful gift, the hallmark of your leadership that says, you know what, Liz, you've arrived. And as proof, here's a team of people to manage. And oh, Liz, we know that you say work would be amazing and, and less complicated were it not for people. And yet that's going to be your primary leadership challenge. How do you lead people from one point to the next. Can you inspire and motivate them to truly perform well? We've got challenges, which means we probably have opportunities. So when we talk about the six team conditions, um, you know, there's this sort of principle, write this down. It's a series of numbers, but I want you to think about it this way. 60, 30, 10. 60, 30, 10. And what do I mean by that? Well, the research highlights that if leaders really want to have the most significant impact on the teams they lead and the people around them, they should be investing 60% of their time into team design. 30% of their time into team launch, so launching the team and 10% of their time providing continuous support, so coaching. Now, I will tell you, if I'm teaching on this or helping actually form teams in the context of some of the work that we do at the Wharton School with executives from all over the world, sometimes I hear things like this. That's an interesting concept. 60% on designing the team, 30% on launching, and 10% on continuous support. Harvey, I'm probably spending about 50% of my time in supporting and coaching the team. 
and then their eyes get very big when you say, and how might that be impacting what the team is able to do? How might that impact your leadership? There is this fundamental belief, and I want you to sort of capture this, that structure drives behavior. Structure drives behavior. And so when we invest time in designing our teams, which I know, to be quite honest with you, feels impossible, right? Because you're pulled in a million directions. You have more vision than you have time to execute. You have real challenges that are sort of breathing down your neck day to day. You see opportunities that you can't move quickly enough to, 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 you know, to sort of uh, execute on. And, and, and it just feels like, well, where would I manufacture the time to really invest in team design? Well, here's what the science proves that when we do, we tend to see a more significant return on the investment of our energy. Structure drives behavior. So for that leader who is saying, I spend about 50% of my time managing human behavior and dynamics on my team, that actually is probably a function of a team that may not be structured as well as it could or should be. Because if we got the design and the structure piece right, Ultimately, you would do less coaching, less of this sort of interpersonal intervening and more true sort of leading of that team. Now, that 30 percent I love, and I just want you to sort of replay in your own mind. To what extent have I really invested in designing the team that I'm leading? Or if I'm about to launch a new entrepreneurial effort, am I really thinking about the design of the team? Or am I really thinking about just like getting it off the ground? Let's go make things happen, right? We can't wait. Passion is beating in our chest. Now that team launch is really important, but should only sort of take about 30% of our focus, right? But so like, what is the, you know, the 60% really about? Well, there are a couple of conditions that we want to focus on, right? Do you actually have a real team? Right? Does this work actually need a team in the first place? And if so, can I put together like a stable group of individuals and and then keep them long enough, uh, keep them working together long enough to actually see results and actually experience that idea that Harvey keeps talking about, the team being sort of better than the sum of its parts? The other piece is compelling purpose. Like, to what extent have I truly identified a compelling purpose for, for our team and, and then conveyed it. To what extent have I imagined it, articulated it, conveyed it? Does it feel like it matters? Does it feel challenging? Does it feel consequential? Is it clear? One of the other six conditions that's really important for us to focus on, particularly in that designing stage is, do, uh, you know, do we have the right people? And this is where we can start to talk about diversity. Do I have the right people to get the mission accomplished? Can I convene the right people with, you know, sort of the right intersection of skills and, 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 and sort of task abilities and capabilities, but also teamwork skills diversity of skill set, mindset, background to really deliver on our purpose. The next is solid structure. Well, do we actually have norms that support our ways of working? And are we clear on the things that we must do, the practices that we must adhere to and abide by to actually deliver The fifth would be a supportive organizational context. What resources do we have? What resources do we need? Do we have access to them? Are we actually in the position to reward excellence? And when we lastly sort of think about, you know, the um, sixth condition, that's team coaching. It's important. What really matters is making sure that it can come from anywhere in the team when we need it to, if the leader doesn't necessarily sort of engage in being a team coach of the team. So we're talking about helpfulness and availability. 
Now, these are the sort of fundamental six conditions that when they are in place, they create the environment for team performance, real team, compelling purpose, right people, having a solid structure, a supportive organizational context and team coaching. And when we have those things in place, now my role as a leader fundamentally shifts. I can now think about at the beginning of the sort of life cycle with my team, how am I getting them motivated to do the work? And then along the sort of like the midpoint of our journey and our work together, how can I do more sort of consultative coaching with the team? How are we doing? Well, here's what we said we wanted to accomplish by a certain period of time. How are we doing relative to what's important to us? And then at the end, it's really sort of thinking about how I engage with the team from an educational perspective. Hey, let's reflect. Let's really get beneath the surface of our performance. What do we set out to accomplish? How did we actually do? Do we know why or why not? What worked? What didn't work? And what can we apply moving forward? So we can be a learning team, a learning agile team, because chances are, given the environment that we're in, we're going to have to overcome one challenge after the next, after the next, after the next. And so if we can become both individual and sort of individually and collectively learning agile, we can really accelerate the ability to move forward. Now, this work's not easy, but it's powerful. So if I'm at the Wharton School and I'm lecturing uh, or supporting the formation of, of teams, or if I'm doing this work for the company, I really am helping them slow down and really imagine what the future would look like if we could put these six conditions in place. And then how do we take accountability for our own learning and, and ability to do this together Maybe it's an African proverb that I fundamentally sort of, you know, subscribe to that if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And so I think as a leader, we have every opportunity and possibility to truly amplify our leadership impact and truly make our leadership sustainable. Because friends, let me just be very honest with you. This really is a marathon. It can feel like a sprint day to day. I heard a quote recently that said, you know, the days are long, but the years go by quickly, right? I think usually people are talking about uh, parents with small children <laughs> when they say that. As a father of four, Liz, you know that I absolutely know this all too well and have the beard to confirm it. The days are long, but the years fly by. And the same thing is true in our organizational context. So I want you to just pause for a second and think, okay, I've heard a couple of things, maybe some that resonate, maybe some that don't resonate so much. Like what's really coming up for you? Liz, let me actually turn the table to you while people are thinking themselves. What did you hear in that that really resonates with maybe your own experience or, or you recognize as being you know, a potential opportunity? Um, oh my gosh. There are some questions that are starting to come in that I, I love it. get to, which is awesome. Um, and before we get to, to those and to what I heard, I just want to make sure for everybody that we hear the six things that there are six. Am I holding up six? So yeah. you talked about purpose, identifying the right people, getting a solid structure, um, supportive organizational context. That's right. That coaching, I'm missing. That's right. Uh, real team. Are we actually a real team? Are we a real team? Yeah. Like, do we need to be uh, a team? Are we a real team? Um, and if so, right? Yes. What does that look like for us? Can we design our work accordingly? Yes. Yes. 
Okay, so we have a question from Sah Sarah Mohammed, and she asks, is leadership a calling? And how do you know it is your calling? Some people say, oh, you're born a leader or this and that. Um, but I think a lot of things can be taught and learned. Nobody's you know, inherently just born automatically a leader, right? Otherwise, you'd be out of the job, maybe. <laughs> Yeah. Well, listen, I love the question. And Liz, I think you're exactly right. Now, listen, it feels good to say leaders are born, right? You've probably seen people do those messages and the, you know, the PSAs and it's like, yeah, but like, but what about the rest of us who feel like I was not born to be a leader, <laughs> right? Do we just not fit into that equation called leader? So I fundamentally believe that uh, we can learn to become great leaders. It does take time, but I do believe that we can learn our way into impactful and effective leadership. OK, now the results and sort of like around managerial competence don't look so great. Uh, they they typically sort of state that about 55, I think anywhere from 50 to 55 uh, percent of, of managers are just poor and, and you know, uh, less than. <laughs> less than effective. So it, it says that like even you know, in the world of leading, we all have a ways to go and learn. So I would say rather than trying to get clear on, I really believe that this is like my purpose and my calling. I think there's a, I think that's valuable. But what I would say is focus more on, okay, what are the skills and competencies that I need to develop in order to be an effective leader? And there's this other idea around leadership as a social process. So my former organization would say leadership is a social process that really sort of involves three things, direction, alignment and commitment. Where are we going? To what extent are we aligned, you know, in terms of our people and processes and then commitment? How do we know that people are motivated enough, if you will, to do the work and take up the task and move forward? So if we have direction and alignment and commitment, that is a social process, right? Leadership is a process. And then you would naturally ask the question, well, everyone could commit to that, right? Everybody can contribute to that. So think about your team. Maybe leadership as a social process gives us all the ability to say, I can contribute in some way to the process of direction, to the process of alignment and commitment of that and one thing i heard you say there was to think about what skills do i need to get right I, I think a lot of times people think oh let me just focus on my strengths i'm good at this i'm bad at this i'm just gonna build up my strengths and blah 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 but it's important to you know remember that you can also build up new skills and yes build up your strengths but look at what else is needed build those up you know, maybe get some team members who have, you know, strengths that you don't and that kind of thing. Um, so I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about that. And then we also have a question from Arlene yeah. Farrow and she asks that age old question, what do you do? How do you handle that difficult team member? <laughs> All right. So listen, I love that question. Let me take one step back and then I'll come to that question. How do you handle difficult people? Um, Liz, your question was uh, sort of speaking to, I just lost my train of thought, I'm so sorry. That's what happens when you're live and in the moment. You raised an insight and a question. About uh, the, oh, the skills. Building up new skills, not just uh, building your strengths. I gave you two questions, it's my fault. <laughs> that's right, hey, that's okay, that's okay. Testing my ability to listen. Uh, so, you know, there are a number of ways that we help leaders identify what skills and abilities they need. So, you know, like in the world of leadership development, we tend to use things like psychometric tools and assessments, right? And some of those things really help you understand um, how you're doing, maybe even your hard wiring, uh, if you will. Uh, there are some on the market that uh, I don't uh, I don't endorse, um, but, you know, there are some that are really sort of, you know, valid and, and will help you better understand sort of what you already bring. But I think one of the best ways, one of the best tools we have is a 360, right? So when you have worked alongside your colleagues for any period of time, right? Being able to undertake a 360 degree sort of review process, assessment process of what is working and what is not, and having them sort of help you fill in the gaps, 
identify what's in the blind spot that if you were to take action on it would contribute to greater leadership uh, you know effectiveness so that 360 is often a tool but there's another tool that i use sometimes with leaders it's a feed forward process so sometimes i'll be working with a leader and i'll have him or her identify what is a new competency that you'd like to develop what is a new skill you'd like to sort of bester, uh, better bolster if you will and then how do you use the people around you to give you insight on that. So you go to the team and say, hey team, one of the things I'd like to work on over the next three, four, five, six months is X. Uh, what thoughts and or insights do you have for me about how I could do that? And you might identify some themes and patterns. So you, you know, you spend time speaking with those five or six people and maybe four of them actually agree that one or two of these things would really benefit you. And so then you go, okay, I think I'm really gonna focus on these one or two things. And so that's feed forward as opposed to feedback. But I think those are two pathways that can get you there. And then sometimes in organizations, we use skill matrices and such, and, and we can you know help a person understand how they're doing. This is where I think leadership is really so important. Being clear about what matters, what are those competencies that drive effectiveness and success for the organization and teams, and then helping leaders see how they're doing relative to that. So if you're leading a team, running a business, and you're an entrepreneur, I think it is not just your privilege, but your responsibility and obligation to be clear, to understand how to offer feedback and to put people on the right behavioral pathway to contributing and being at their best. Um, so great question. Let's, uh, I believe that question, uh, happy to, to, to dive back to her question. How do you handle difficult people? You know, listen, um, Classic organizational psychologist answer here. It depends. <laughs> no, I think, you know, as long as there are people in the workplace, we're going to have to deal with difficult behavior. So I think clarity is key. Um, with a couple of my leaders, we use this sort of one liner that clarity begets clarity. And so when the standard for behavior is clear, when we know exactly uh, what it takes to deliver in a particular role, the behaviors that we should do and or abide by and people step outside of that, then I think we have to provide them with feedback. Um, one of the ways to do that, if I were to hit just a quick sort of model, just to help you sort of frame your thinking around this is situation, behavior, impact. What was the actual situation? This is where you need to be clear and specific, thinking about the time and the place that that behavior happened. So I wouldn't just say, Liz, you're arrogant. Well, what does that actually mean? What I would say is, hey, Liz, situation. In our meeting last week, when I was speaking and you interrupted me multiple times. So now Liz goes, oh, Last week in the meeting, you were speaking, I interrupted it. Thank you for allowing me to pick on you, Liz. That has never happened, by the way. But be very specific about the time and the place situation. What is the behavior that this person is demonstrating? Be very specific. Interrupting, right? Whatever else it might be. And then the impact that that behavior has on you or maybe even sort of the team's ways of working, right? Because people need to, to be able to sort of slow down in the moment because feedback is not oftentimes easy to, easy to receive. But if you can slow me down to help me understand, okay, time and place, got it. The specific thing that I did, because if you attribute it to the person and not the behavior, what it sounds like is you need to change. You're a problem. But what you really want to focus on by carving out the behavior is this behavior doesn't work. And here is the impact of this behavior on me. On the team situation, behavior impact. So that's just a little model and a framework that will help you navigate those moments of dealing with a person who can be difficult, but it's really identifying the behavior that is getting in the way and impeding progress or how it is impacting you individually. So I suspect that if you were to take that kind of a path and they could very clearly see the behavior, I'm not suggesting that they're gonna be open in the moment to hearing the feedback. 
What I am saying is there's a greater likelihood that they can cut through the noise and identify very quickly, uh, quickly how what they are doing is impacting people. And then they get to choose if that's the impact they want to continue to have. Great question. Thank you, Harvey. That was really, really powerful. Always important to focus on the behavior and not make it personal. Right. Absolutely. Not, not, you're bad. You're bad. This this particular thing, you know, was a disruption. Um, so that question actually came from Asha. The question from Arlene is in a startup, how do you balance the intent of giving people opportunities and developing them to ensure the company um, has the right team it needs to get the job done? Gosh, and what a great question. I'm actually coaching two entrepreneurs right now who are having a very similar challenge. They're in startup mode. And so perhaps they weren't very intentional at the beginning, right? Because it's like, I've got this vision, I've got to execute. I'm, you know, maybe I'm trying to pursue funding or have some, you know, some funding, um, but I, I'm taking willing hands. And then at some point, now they're going, Willingness is okay, but I think I need something a little different right now, right? And so how do I afford people the opportunity uh, to invest in them, right? And and allow them to help shape this. Um, and inevitably, you know, we might have to ask hard questions of ourselves. So what I advise um, you know, one of my coaching clients to do was to seek legal counsel. Now he, because he had to terminate someone who uh, whose performance was not up to par. Now, in his case, he was well justified because he had had multiple conversations with this person about the, the, the product that they, you know, and their output and how it didn't meet the standard. And he had given them multiple opportunities to do that. And it just still wasn't meeting the standard. And so it was documented. He sought legal counsel. And he was advised to terminate the employee and to be very clear. So what he had working to his advantage was that did not come as a surprise to that employee. It was documented and they could go back and look at three or four instances of where the product didn't meet the expected outcome. I'm also coaching another entrepreneur who has just been moving so quickly. He didn't think about that because he's working from sunup until sundown. And he's doing his best to make things happen. He is a well-intentioned leader like all of us. And he's only now realizing I have four people <laughs> who are not meeting the standard. So we've had to take a couple of steps back to identify well, what needs to be put in place now to be clear about what the standard is. And what do you have to do as a leader to demonstrate even more accountability here? Yes, they are responsible to execute the work and do it well, but as the leader, you're accountable. And if you hadn't helped them understand from the beginning what good looked like and what the standard was, it's going to be very difficult now to tell them they're not meeting it. So he is taking, he's taking one step back, relaunching, right? Hey, let's do a reset. You know, here to moving forward, this is the standard. And he has one person who is excelling and he has taken that work that they have been doing and contributing and saying, listen, here is what helps us move forward. And so now they're building a couple of tools and processes around that. He's giving that person an opportunity to mentor the other people, to bring them along. It happens to be a woman, by the way, and four men. Right. And um, so for the feminists out there, go. Uh, and and so now they're having um, more robust conversations around how this meets the need and the standard and the impact of this, you know, a product done and delivered this way versus the others. So now they can see what it looks like. So that's a bit of a long winded story, but I hope between the two, you can find an action and or a behavior in there that helps you think about what do I do differently as a leader or as someone on the team to offer clear feedback about what good looks like, what is and is not working and how we know. No, that was really helpful. What I'm hearing is, you know, if you're starting a team, you want to look for the right people with the skills you need, who believe in the purpose of the team, but also from the get go, set those expectations in a way that can be agile, because I think those expectations, everything changes as you get moving. Um, 
but but then also has an accountability structure. Um, so that's that's super important. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Uh, we do have another question here from Lewis. He asks, is team performance largely dependent on the team leader or the team itself? It's a really good one. That's a really wonderful question, Lewis. I'm going to say it's a combination of the two because the leader at the end of the day is accountable for the team's performance. This work of leading teams is really critical. Some of us are doing the best we can and just haven't learned quickly enough how to help position teams to deliver. So I'd like to think that the accountability lies with the leader. The responsibility to get the work done is the teams. Now, when we hear feedback from our clients, from our customers, from our stakeholders, that really tells us how we're actually doing. And so if we keep those feedback channels very clear, very strong, the leader and the team should always know and have an understanding of how they're doing relative to expectations. And then the leader should be able to sort of calibrate or recalibrate along the way when things are not working. So this is where becoming reflective sort of teams is really important after action review, right? Um, in the State Department, maybe a hot wash after an event, right? Uh, but how do we pause and reflect on how we're doing, what is working, what isn't working? And then how do we apply those lessons and insights moving forward? And then sometimes when you become sort of proficient enough at that, you can launch what we call a before action review, right? And these are the things that can really sort of govern our work, our ways of working. So we have a much better sense of how we're doing. And it should always be the responsibility of the leader to help the team understand how their work fits in the context of what is most important to the organization or how their work delivers on the client's needs and expectations. So the team is not operating in a bit of a blind spot. Like we just, we just do stuff, but we never really know how it impacts others. Like we don't actually feel that our work is consequential, that it matters. So that leader, I, you know, I think it's a symbiotic process. It's, you know, it's give and take, it's back and forth, it's dynamic, it's iterative, but we should all be sort of acting in the same direction. And the leader should be able to take that 20,000 foot view to think about how do I inspire, motivate my team to perform? What does the team need from me in order to do that? And how do I position them to really succeed? Thank you, Harvey. That was great. Um, I heard talking about, again, setting those expectations from the beginning, maybe even before you set out in a project, being agile, being flexible, reflecting afterwards, getting in those right. lessons learned. And again, going back to that purpose, ensuring that everyone understands and have, takes value and pride in their piece of the project, right? Absolutely. I, I, a lot of people, I think, reference a story from NASA, right, about a janitor who said something like, someone made a comment, oh, you're cleaning the floor. He's like, no, I'm helping astronauts go to space. You know, this is my purpose. Absolutely. This is why I'm here. Um, so, and then that is an important role. Okay. We can't be walking around in a dirty place <laughs> no. and get work done. So every role matters. Absolutely. You know, let me sort of underscore one other thing here in the work that I do with my colleagues. I, I you know, I really love this because it, it warrants a conversation around like, what are the structures and processes that we should put in place to really help us think differently and take action. And so many of you are probably familiar with the concept of, of you know, of a, of a team charter. Right. Which gives you the opportunity at the outset to be very clear. Uh, we have actually sort of built one around the 16 conditions. Um, and I'd be happy to uh, make sure that in some way, shape or form, I can provide maybe a document or something. Or you can you can come to our website at six team conditions dot com to learn a bit more about that. But, you know, that team charter could sound something like this. You know, real team. What are the reasons for being a team at this time? Compelling purpose. What is our clear, compelling, and consequential purpose? What does success look like to those that we serve? Right people. What skills and diversity of perspectives do we have on this team? What teamwork skills are the most essential to us executing on our mission? Sound structure. What is the primary goal? What is our approach to working? What are the norms that we will agree to and abide by? 
supportive context. And I'll make sure you have a copy of this, but supportive context. What's our strategy for engaging the context to get resources and support to move the work forward? And then lastly, that team coaching piece. What's our coaching strategy to minimize process losses? Because what tends to happen is the more people you add to a team outside of that perfect number of four to six, the more people you add outside of that, we tend to see process loss. So like, how do we coach ourselves to minimize process loss to ensure that, you know, people here are really contributing and, and we can experience the gains that are necessary. And there's this sort of sense of individual and team learning that undergirds what we're doing. We're short on time. I want to try to get in two more questions from Absolutely. the audience if we can. Um, from Grace, how do I, as part of the team, encourage the manager to become more effective without overstepping the hierarchy? How do you manage up? Would it be wise to take initiative to lead the team from behind? How do I do that? Grace, uh, welcome to uh, real life. <laughs> How do I get my team leader to be a better team leader? Um, you know, feedback in this instance could be really challenging, right? Because what leader wants to hear from a subordinate? I'm using that language intentionally by design because it is so offensive. But you know what? Because it, because it feels that way, right? But what what leader wants to hear from someone who reports to them that their leadership? isn't bringing out the best in the team. So I think you have to be very, very careful. You know, one way to sort of engage in this kind of a process maybe is to sort of sit with the leader and say, hey, listen, I have been thinking a lot about what makes teams great. I've been reading. I'm just curious to know, you know, I see a couple of opportunities for our team to really become even more high performing. There's some things that I think we're doing well, and I'm just wondering, you know, maybe your thoughts and insights on what you think the team can do even better, you know, as a collective team to really help, you know, you excel as a leader. Now, that sounds like being politically savvy, but you're couching it in, hey, we know that it's important on your watch to deliver as a leader. I've been thinking about things that are working well that are not, but I want to engage you as well to think about what can we do as a team? to improve our performance. Um, sometimes I'll send out a quick table. Um, it's four quadrant on one. It says you get the best of me win. The other says you get the worst of me win. Another quadrant is you can count on me too. And the fourth is here's what I need from you. And sometimes this can be a very quick tool to accelerate the process of alignment between leaders and teams, colleagues and colleagues, peers and peers. We've got one more question. I'll give you the brief. One more question. It kind of piggybacks off of that and goes back to a question from earlier. I'll ask this question and then ask you to give maybe some closing remarks. Um, this comes from Kathy. How do you deal with people who aren't open to any kind of criticism? They just don't want to hear it. That's tough. Um, <laughs> I think being clear is important. Being clear is being kind. And it's not your job to ensure that this person receives the feedback, if you will. It's our responsibility to offer it. So when I gave that model earlier, situation behavior impact, I think if we can highlight the situation and the, the behavior that people are doing and the impact on others, we have done our job to be clear and to help them maybe see what is in their blind spot. Now, it is often the case that people, when they hear feedback, they become defensive, they bristle up, they go through this sort of shock, anger, resistance, and then maybe acceptance because it feels personal. So I think when we are clear about the situation, the behavior, and the impact, it gets us into and through the conversation. And hopefully it creates the receptivity so they can really not just hear the noise, but listen to the message and identify what it is they can do to take that one step, make that one small adjustment or adapt their behavior to be in better sync and alignment 
So I think it warrants practice. I would say if you're going to give feedback to someone, practice delivering that feedback with someone else first. Write it out. Practice in the moment. Get feedback on them and then deliver it to your colleague. Thank you, Harvey. Okay, we are, it looks like we are right at time, but I'll give you a chance just to give like some quick closing remarks. We did get one more question about differentiating my flaws as a team leader and that of the team members and how to improve team performance. So maybe speak to that and then close that. <laughs> uh, come to 16conditions.com. You'll find lots of tools and or resources uh, to help. Uh, my contact information, I'll do my best to make available as well. Look me up on LinkedIn if you like. Uh, I'd be happy to, you know, fire off a couple of um, sort of tools and resources if that's helpful. Um, you know, let me just sort of say this. Um, it's not easy. And yet I think we have remarkable opportunities to lead well. And we think of the fact that maybe we are actually better together. Um, it does warrant a deeper conversation around how do I leverage and or wield teams to really solve some of our most complex and, and pressing challenges? Um, is it possible? to help a team truly experience becoming greater than the sum of its parts? And what do I need to do as a leader to foster that reality? Can I create the conditions for teams to really lead well? And if I'm a team member, how can I support our team in really performing above and beyond? What can I do differently to contribute to that process? How can I be a part of shaping it and those outcomes? I am really, really grateful to have been of service to you this morning as you really think about the art of servant leadership, being of service to your teams and helping them deliver on your vision and theirs. Thank you so very much for your questions and engagement. Um, I'm deeply grateful. Liz, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harvey, for your time today. Take good care, everyone. All right. I think this concludes our session. Recordings will be available on State Department websites. So stay tuned for information about that. I'll make sure everybody has it. Um, feel free to reach out to us as LinkedIn as well, as Harvey said. Good things ahead. Good things ahead.